lovely to have you in class yes, too. Yes, thank you. Ah, lovely. Excellent. It's great having everybody in class with us. Um, lovely to see all of you and to maybe learn a little about the other African animals that we have. Yeah. Everybody learns about the lion and the elephant and the giraffe and the zebra and the cheetah. Now, for this particular one, we are going to change and we are going to be learning about animals you don't necessarily always see and but ones that are very necessary in in keeping the ecosystems going in the different places i'm just waiting for james who is our my ta my technical assistant he's just setting up the live streaming then i'll get my host back and i'll be able to do what i need to do with you um, Ute, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes. Yes. Um, oh, lovely. Ute, lovely. Great. Fantastic. And uh, there are lots of people I see regularly, like Natalie. Um, Ute has now been made host, James. Can you make me host, please? Yeah, you know, then let me check what happened wrong. Let me see if I can reclaim host. Hold on. Let me see if I can reclaim host. Okay, I've reclaimed host. All right. Now, uh, let me make you the co-host and then we can begin. Right. Today, mm -hmm. I'm excited to talk about the different animals. Uh, each of them has their own personality. And some of them I've had some close encounters with along the way. Um, in fact, next month, we <laughs> are doing an interactive class called um, Encounters with Wild Animals. And I, everybody's going to bring their own stories of when they have met an animal or seen a particular interesting animal and it'll be almost like a coffee hour an interactive class and I hope to have a, quite a few different people bringing their stories of what they've seen or done. I have some to share as well and so we I hope we'll be able to to do it all together. Right now the first picture we've got here is for me one of the cutest animals we have, very inquisitive animal called the meerkat. And he stands up like this and he's always around and they live in big colonies together. But we'll discuss them just now. They are such cute animals. It's lovely to see all you with your okay, cameras on, we can see you and I can then interact with you, which is great. If you want a recording afterwards, you can get it at help at getsetup.io. Um, if we're joining by live streaming, the best way is to participate and join us. Um, and anything I might mention, we're not paid to do any specific products. A little about myself. I live in Perth, Australia, so I am 10 a.m. in the morning, uh, bright and breezy. I've been an educator for 44 years, but now on Get Set Up, I share. I share my experiences, my ideas, and for me, that is so awesome. I, have a, I enjoy creating and making puzzles, and I have a great love of animals. That's why we have the Australian and the African series. Now, today we're going to learn some interesting animals, the tall, the short, no matter who they are, they all have their own personalities. When I lived in South Africa, which I did for 63 years, I spent a lot of time in the bush and I learned about many of the animals and observed how they reacted, how they behaved, what they did. And so they all have unique personalities. Um, and sometimes you're lucky oh. enough to see them participate and do things. Right, let's have a look. We're going to start today with a very busy animal, the warthog. He has two very large tusks that come out the front and a tail at the back. And when he is moving, his tail stands straight up. And very often there's a little white patch on the end. And in the long grass, all you can see is just this little patch moving through the grass. And you know that the warthog is on the move. He is a not an aggressive animal, but as we all know, any wild animal you treat with great respect and you give them their space. 
I had a, an incident with a warthog where I was taking a photograph of the warthog. He was quite close to me and I got down low and I had my camera and I was busy getting the right picture. And my friend who was traveling with me said, stand up slowly and walk backwards. I said, but I'm nearly there. I've almost got the picture. She said, stand up now. So I clicked the shutter and I stood up and looked. This warthog wasn't even this far away from my nose. He had walked up and because I was looking through the lens, I just thought I was getting a better picture of him. So I then very gently walked backwards and he went off to go and get something. But had I stayed sitting squatting much longer, I could have had a warthog sitting on top of me. And I don't think I wanted that because I, they're not aggressive, but he may have given me a bit of a, a, a workover um, purely because I was something that he didn't know. Uh, so warthogs are great. Interesting thing they do, they go onto their their elbows when they are eating. They eat the low grass and instead of leaning down, they actually go on their elbows and they eat the food that they want to eat on their elbows and then stand up and walk away. The warthogs you find in three groups. You find all the men. The men love to be together, um, the older men. You get the young bachelors who are out on the town looking for a nice lady. And then you get the mothering group, um, which is the matriarchal group. And um, those are the ones that have got all the little babies with them. They can often be found at water holes at all times of the day because they like the mud. So they go to the warthog and they uh, to the water hole and they dig around in the mud. So if you click onto a live water hole, you are quite likely to see a warthog at least once or twice a day playing there. They find any kind of burrow that they want um, to just to give them a little bit of protection. Then they and they go in a bit backwards so that the front of them is facing out of the burrow. So if any something does come to have a look, it doesn't just find their rump. It actually encounters them. Most animals that live in burrows go in backwards so that they are facing any enemy that might come. Any questions about the warthog? Okay, let's move on then to the artfark. Now that's an Afrikaans word. Um, it's one of the languages in South Africa. It means a pig of the earth, if we translate it into English. Um, the artfark is a very beautiful little animal. Um, he eats, uh, he feeds at night and he goes to where the termite nests are. Now, the artfark um, ha has a very, very long tongue. His tongue is up to 30 centimeters long. That's the length of a ruler. So he's got an incredibly long tongue that he can stick into the termite nest and then everything sticks to the termite nest, uh, to his tongue, and he brings his tongue out. And he can do that up to 90 times a night, just sticking his tongue in and bringing it out, collecting food uh, on, on the way. So he really does he, um, have an interesting way of eating when the babies are born, they are hairless. And so they, they have a quite a long gestation period of seven months, just less than a human. Um, and they are pink and hairless. And they stay in the burrow for about two weeks before they come up. And then they're just starting to get their hair. So they still look kind of pink along the way. They've got very long ears and short front arms, long back legs, because because those are the strongest part for them. Um, during the day, they sleep curled up in a tight ball so that you can't really see what they are. They have incredible hearing, but their eyesight is bad. So that if you move very slowly away, if you come across an artwork and you don't want to disturb it, if you stand still, it may not even see you. But if you move and make a sound, they will move because their hearing is really, really good.
Um, and when they're frightened, they bleat like a little sheep. They go, bah, bah, bah. they sound like a sheep that's in distress. It's, it's a, a quite a sad sound. So you, you hear that in the night and you know that something has upset an aardvark. And you don't see them that often. You've got to look for them. They are around. They, they are not only in the big game reserves, they are in any area where there's a lot of open land. And in South Africa, we still have a lot of open land. Oh, my computer's decided we're going to do it this way. Okay. Sorry, I we've had some interesting times this morning, so I do apologize for that. We'll go this way. Um, there's been a few glitches this morning with not only my computer, but um, Zoom as well. So I'm just holding my breath. Uh, any questions about the artfark? The artfark is about seven meters long. Um, so he's quite a long and sorry, not seven meters. <laughs> um, he he's um, he weighs about uh, sixty-five kilos. So he's quite a thing, and he's two meters long. Sorry, two meters, seven seven foot. He's seven foot in length, uh, and he can run at about thirty-five kilometers an hour. So he can run pretty fast if he needs to, and he lives for about fifteen years in the wild. So they have quite a long lifespan. Any questions about the artvark? Very beautiful little animal. Right. Now, these are very beautiful animals as well. The wild dog. You don't see them that often. When you do, you say thank you for seeing them because they, they really are an amazing group of, of animals. They live together in a pack um, and they are a small to a medium sized dog. Um, and they, when they hunt in a pack, they can pretty much take anything down. They love an impala because it's just the right size for them to be able to take down. One dog on its own might have a bit of problem, but when hunting in a pack, it's very easy to take down some prey. The dominant male and female are the only ones that breed. All the other dogs do not breed while those two are dominant. When something happens to either of the dominant members of the family, a new dominant member is uh, comes into play, both on the female or the male side. But the rest of them, they are very happy to act as helpers. So the wild dog population does not grow fast because there's only one dog producing in each pack. So it, it's very important to keep the dynamics of these dogs. They do have a large litter, though. They have a large litter of up to about 12 dogs um, in each litter. And then not only does the, the mother look after the babies, some of the other females lactate as well, even though they haven't produced and they are able to help to feed the, the, the newborn pups. And that helps the mom a lot. Um, there can be as many 50, as 50 dogs in a pack. So the packs can be really big and eventually some of them will break away and form their own pack. But it takes time. So the packs grow as they go along. Also, uh, they don't produce if the conditions are not right. If there's a drought and there's not enough food for them and the animal population is dropping, they will not produce. When there is a good weather, there's good food for the impala and all the other animals, then the, the wild dog will produce more, more babies. Um, they can go as high as an earlunt. Now, on the last page, I will show you an earlunt. It is a really big um, buck. It is really big. Um, he stands oh, probably taller than me, so probably two meters he will stand. And he is a heavy animal. So for them to take that down, it is quite amazing. They also will feed on a rabbit or a hare. So they, they don't mind what size their 
prey is. It depends on the size of the pack, because if you've got a big pack, you need to kill quite a few animals in order to feed the whole pack. So that is something they have to work out and think about. Any questions on the wild dog? Yes, so mm. Mm. do the wild dogs have a lot of puppies like regular dogs? They have 12, 12, 12, 12 puppies at a time. So they have a pretty oh, big okay. litter. Mm. They have a litter of up to mm -hmm. 12 babies. But of course, remember, there's only one dog that's producing. All the other dogs do not. Mm -hmm. Only the dominant pair are allowed to have babies. I'm not sure what happens if something goes wrong. I think they had the, the pair that have made some extra babies are, are abandoned and they have to start their own pack I, i'll actually look up about that because that's that's an interesting thing because boys will be boys and girls will be girls so um <laughs> i'm not quite sure <laughs> um what happens if something goes a little wrong but uh, i will certainly look that up because that's an interesting point um if if a one of the the lesser what they call the lesser beings has a baby um uh, out of wedlock as such now what happens um but it, it's very 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 interesting um and they they make a burrow a big burrow and all the little babies live down in the burrow and they come popping out from the burrow it's very cute we've seen that um when we've been to they, these are these dogs are found only in the big parks like the Kruger National Park where <laughs> they live very happily because the area of the Kruger Park is so big um, all the animals <coughs> live free in that park and they they safe from humans mm -hmm. not so much the humans safe from them they are safe from humans now the wildebeest is a very interesting animal. You do get two types of wildebeest. You get the black wildebeest and you get the white wildebeest. But in South Africa, we get uh, the, sorry, the black wildebeest and the blue wildebeest. Uh, we get mainly the, the black wildebeest. Um, and so we see them more than you see the blue. The difference in color is the one is much darker than the other one. And also sometimes the horns are different on them. Um, the shape of their horns and the color of the coat are the two things you can see. The one has a horn that goes out on the side. That's your blue wildebeest, while the black wildebeest has horns that come out in the front. So very easy to see the difference between the two types of wildebeest um, as, as they grow. When a baby is born, most of the babies of the wild animals actually fit underneath their mothers. And for the first little while, they actually walk under the mother. So they, they like all in one with mum until they are as soon as they grow too big then they start walking outside but all most of the little babies are fit underneath their mum and are, it's a safety net in the wild that the mum can protect her baby but usually if they are in um, a herd which you do find with the wildebeest you find with the different impala and different buck that you have they they live in herds and then the females within the herd form a, a bonding round the mum and baby until the baby is really able to fend for itself so they they work very very well in teams um they love the the wildebeest loves to be with other animals, not only with other wildebeest, they like to be with any of the other um, buck family that there, there are. So they, they really, the antelope, anybody in the antelope family, they all work together. They all live together very harmoniously. Um, and most of them live in, in fact, all of them live in large herds. You get a large herd of impala, large herd of, there are only certain ones like the earlunt where you only see a few at a time. Earlunt, Bontobok, there are the big buck, the little buck all stick together. But the bigger buck, you don't get so many in a, in a herd at a time. Um, they also, they're herbivores. All of the antelopes are herbivores. They all love their grasses or their trees or their bushes that they munch on as they go along. 
Any questions? Okay, right, let's continue. Now we're coming to an interesting animal, very needed in the environment because he is the cleaner. He's the one who cleans up all the scraps and keeps the environment clean. They are a scavenger and they are, they are quite a, a, a cheeky scavenger. If a lion has brought down a kill, or leopards usually put them in the tree so that that, that saves them. But um, a cheetah, if they've got their kill, the hyenas come and they stand at a distance. And if they think that the lion isn't watching, they dart in and grab a piece of meat and run away. And the lion roars at them to tell them to go away. And then the lion watches them for a bit. And while he's watching this one, there's one on this side and the one on this side quickly zooms in, grabs a piece and zooms out. So they, they can be very wily. They, they're very quick to, to grab their little piece of meat. But when the lions are finished and moved away, they will then clean up the bones and they will make sure there's very little of anything left. They have a very strong jaw. They can crack bones. You can see by the mouth of the one that I've shown you there how it's got an incredibly strong jaw with really strong teeth. They, they look kind of a scary animal the way they stand. They, but they, they are so they are needed. And if you look at the face of them, they have a really beautiful face. Um, there are two different types of hyena. There's the brown hyena and the laughing hyena or oh, spotted hyena. The spotted one actually sounds like he's laughing when he calls, um, while the brown hyena makes a completely different sound. Um, they, uh, they breed at any time. They don't have that they breed in springtime or something else. They breed at different times, any time. And they have a three-month gestation period. They can have up to four babies. Um, <clears throat> the hyenas are usually on their own or two of them around. Um, but if, if they are on their own, the, there are others in the area. So when there's a kill, suddenly you'll see a hyena coming from this side and a hyena coming from over there. So they live in the same area, but they don't live as a group. They don't live as a family. Um, and they sleep during the day during uh, under bush. Um, I've seen uh, the babies of the black hyena or the dark brown hyena. They are pitch black. And they usually give birth to them in... Um, tunnels. Sometimes under the roads, you'll have a big, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, culvert. The big, yeah, culvert. Or, yeah, culvert is what I'm looking for. Thank you, Vilhelmina. <laughs> a culvert. And that's where they have their babies. They, they don't go and make a home of their own. They find a culvert. And we were lucky. We stopped. Um, and for some reason, I, I have no idea why we stopped. We thought we would have a look and see what we could see. And suddenly, right in, next to the car, there was a culvert. And out of the culvert came four little babies. They were so cute. They were about that size. And they were pitch black. And they were sort of looking to see what we were. And as soon as we started the car again, they shot quickly back into the culvert where they were safe um, and waiting for mom to bring some food. I think they were possibly hungry and waiting for food to come. Um, but they, um, they are highly intelligent. They yell, they hoop, they cackle. Um, at night, you can hear the hyenas and you can hear it for a long way. You know, sound travels at night. I didn't live in the city center when I lived in South Africa. I lived between two big cities and there was lots of open area around me. And often at night, you would hear the, the hyena calling or you would hear the jackal calling. Um, and you, each of them has their own call. And you know that they are happen to be in our area because they would move around. They would go from one area to another. So sometimes they were in our area, sometimes they weren't. And then the owls would hoot and the hyenas would call. You would think you were in the bush. It really was an awesome way to live. Any questions? 
Not yet. Okay. Right. <clears throat> oh, Gail, yes. Have you got a question? Uh, do you want to unmute? Um, just press Try your space bar. Uh, okay. Just, just your space it. bar. Your space <laughs> bar works. If you put your hand on your space bar, it automatically unmutes you. And when you lift your hand, you go back to mute. So uh, that's well, a nice thing to know. Okay. Yes, Gail. Um, how long were you in Africa, South Africa? 65 years. Okay. Just that was a side question. Now, the no. pictures of the... Um, what were we just oh the hyenas yes were, the hyenas were the two yeah. on the left the two little black ones were they the young ones they are the brown hyenas that oh. you got on the left those are brown hyenas yes those are baby brown hyenas so oh. you can see they basically look black yeah because they look are two little babies yeah they look so different they don't look like the an you know the animals that grow no good with that sloping back and they walk with their their back legs bent as they go along that's their natural oh, gait so they're so doing they, it on purpose okay. yeah they, that's how they do it <laughs> but for me it looks like they're seedy and they're up to no good and they, they're going along so, well i don't um, know after seeing those teeth i yeah they probably are up to no good <laughs> oh yes they are they they're looking they're on the prowl always okay well but, i wanted uh, up I won't adopt the puppies then. <laughs> yeah, the, the puppies are very, very cute. And when they're even smaller, they just look like a furball. <laughs> they are just too yeah, gorgeous. they were very you cute. You could hardly see the nose from the tail because yeah. it's just this ball. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they do grow up to be not as attractive yeah. as the babies. It's the <laughs> opposite of the birds where the swan is this <laughs> ugly duckling and it becomes this beautiful swan. The, the puppies <laughs> of the hyena are much more attractive than yeah, the as they ones. grow they're a little bit meaner <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> uh, they're learning to fight and learning to keep okay. for themselves thank you very much I'm no really problem i'm really enjoying this <laughs> oh good <laughs> that's great i hope everybody else is as well right now the black jackal uh, he's got he's the black back jackal he's just got a stripe of black down his back he's a very skinny looking animal um, he almost looks mangy as he goes along they feed on small mammals reptiles birds eggs fruit carrion um, and um, anything they can find carcasses wonderful they think those are excellent um they can be as as long as half a meter in in size um uh, uh, and so they they are they're from shoulder to weight and they weigh up to 10 kilos they have a short gestation period of only two months um and six puppies can be born they are definitely a springtime animal so obviously, just as autumn is coming, that's when they mate. Winter time, they when there's not as much food for for them, that's when the babies are being um, prepared. And then once August to October, springtime has arrived. Now there's lots of green grass, and the the, the it depends on which part of the country you're in. But where the big parks are, the rain is in summer. So you get dry winters, rainy summers. Um, and so they, that is a good time for them. Um, they are socially monogamous and they bond for life, which is very interesting. So they stick to their own group. They don't change groups. They don't say, oh, I don't like this group today. I'll go and join that group over there. They stick to their own family and their own group. Um, and that, that group is, is their family for life. Uh, so they, they're very uh, faithful animals to, to each other, and they work as a team um, to bring down different um, small prey, uh, such as the small buck, the little uh, bush buck, um, baby impala, baby spring buck, anything that's small, they find they can get to that if, if they if they're lucky enough but they usually go and find where somebody else has killed something they like the owls because the owls will have killed 
a mouse and they have dropped it. That's a lovely feed for them. They don't even have to chase it. It's, it's ready, ready made food. Um, they also eat on the side of the road. Anything that is roadkill is a fantastic feast for them. They like the, they like the roadkill. Um, it means they don't have to feed and look for stuff for themselves. But they're very happy to live on fruit as well if they can't find meat. So they're very much omnivores. If they can find eggs, the only egg I would say they probably wouldn't be able to handle would be an ostrich egg. Because you'll learn later on about an ostrich egg, the size of it and the, and the thickness of the shell. I think they would have a problem at eating one of those. Any questions? Okay, right. Now, this to me is one of the most interesting animals. And if you speak to people in South Africa and you talk about a pangolin, they'll say, where do you find a pangolin? We don't have them in South Africa. And you say, actually, we have a lot of pangolins in South Africa. It's just not an animal you see very often. And if you do see it, you are so fortunate in seeing the pangolins and being able to see them. Um, I just want to check there's some things uh, in, in our oh, fantastic James. Thank you. James is putting a whole lot of stuff into the uh, chat box for you. Added information. Thank you, James. You're a star. <laughs> He's awesome. He puts all sorts of extra bits in for me every time. Um, the pangolin looks like, for me, it, it takes me back to the knights and castles days when you wore armor. And if you go into a museum, you see this armor that they used to wear. This is what the pangolin looks like. He looks like he's wearing armor. But uh, he, had, he lives inside a, a underground, again, always backing into the underground. So your face is facing the enemy if it should come. And um, the little babies, when they travel around, they don't oh. walk. They sit on mom's tail. They plonk themselves on the back of mom's tail and off they go. They get a ride wherever they are going. Um, the pangolin also rolls itself into a ball. It's very difficult for an animal to eat a pangolin because those uh, pieces that look like tiles that fit over are sharp. And you would, they would, an animal would cut its paw or its tongue if it tried to get in to the soft part of the pangolin inside. So they, they've got um, the, these fantastic overlapping scales, but of course, not on the front of their head and not underneath. So then they can roll up because otherwise they'd hurt themselves if they rolled up, if they had it inside as well. So they've got this lovely, it's almost like a, a hedgehog, the softness inside and the prickles on the outside. They've just got this on, on the outside. And you find them in a lot of areas uh, down in the Western Cape. Uh, and Eastern Cape, you find a lot of pangolins. Um, they have a gestation period of 135 days, which is about four months, just over four months. Um, and they also let off a terrible smell if uh, something comes and starts to threaten them. They like a skunk. They let off this horrific smell that you don't want to smell at all and so you are able to it sends them away uh, just so that the enemies don't like it um, and they use those scales they use that tail they whop with their tail and if you see a whole lot of razors coming towards you you beat a hasty retreat you don't want to be hit by those very sharp pieces so that is our pangolin and as I say, half my friends, when I spoke about what I was going to talk about, they said, but pangolins aren't in South Africa. I said, oh, yes, they are. You just haven't seen them. Those of them that are animal lovers like myself and go to the parks a lot, they then would say, oh, yes, we don't see them often. But if we do, it's a sight to see. Any questions? Right, now, let's have a look. Um, we will move on. Why won't my computer move on? Pangolin, ah, to the ostrich. Aha. He is such an interesting animal. He loves 
anything shiny. If he sees any, so he'll eat a diamond ring that's on the ground. He'll eat a stones on the ground. If they sparkle, he'll eat them. He loves anything shiny. And they are the largest flightless bird in the world. There are two others, both found in Australia. You've got the cassowary and the emu are the other two flightless birds that we have, the big ones. Um, the ostrich has incredibly long eyelashes because they live in the desert areas and the dust comes up. So the eyelashes protect the eyes from any dust storms that might be coming. Um, they've got long legs, very muscular legs. They can run. They can motor at 45 miles an hour. And they often have uh, races. If you go to an ostrich farm, you can actually race on an ostrich. You have to hang on tight, otherwise you will definitely fall off. Um, they eat, eat anything and everything from roots and plants to insects. Um, and they they swallow grit and rocks to break down the food. They they are very much oh. like the crocodile. You can't. They don't. They can't chew the food they it's impossible so they swallow the small stones the smart sparkly stones and those grind the food in their stomachs um they can survive with up to two weeks without water which is quite amazing they do have like a, a an area in their stomach a pouch that make, maintains the water just like a camel does um, and they have an incredible wingspan a, a very very large wingspan it's over six feet when they they can't fly but if they're coming at you flapping they are very dangerous looking you you disappear because they look like they are going to attack you the males are black females are brown and white um they are brown and white and makes it easy. Um, now, looking at an ostrich egg, an ostrich egg is this size. It is the size of 14 chicken eggs. So an ostrich egg is really big. If you had to crack the ostrich egg and put it in a pan, you would need a frying pan this size to fry one ostrich egg. So mostly people beat up the ostrich egg and they make um, a scrambled egg because it's a much easier way of doing it. But um, I have seen they, they do it at some of the places where if you ask for a, a fried egg, you get a plate with one very, very large fried egg on the plate. So it is great fun to see. Um, but what they usually do with the ostrich eggs is they drain them. They put a hole at the top and the bottom. They blow the insides out and use that as your egg. And then they paint the eggs because the shell is very strong. And they are a, a tourist attraction, a very important tourist attraction for the ostrich farmers. The feathers are used for feather dusters. Um, the feathers that the fancy dancers wear when they do their can-can at the Las Vegas, those are ostrich feathers that have been dyed different colors because they really are a big plume feather. And uh, I don't know if they use fa uh, fake ones nowadays, but they were certainly always the ostrich feathers that were used for that. Um, there's a saying that an ostrich stick, don't be an ostrich and stick your head in the sand. If you don't want to do something or you don't want to see something, just pretend you don't see it. They say that an ostrich thinks if his head is in the sand, no one can see him. But I don't know if that's really true. They also are busy digging for things in the ground. So that could also be. But it's a lovely story to use. They can kick you really hard. Do not ever go behind an ostrich because they will kick you really hard. Um, it is, they've got powerful back legs. Any questions? And also their beak is very very, very sharp. Don't get in front of them either. So just keep your distance, watch them from a distance. When they do racing, they actually cover the beak so that the bird can't bite as somebody climbs on their back. Otherwise, the, nobody would be able to do it. Yes, Gail. Did you say they do not put their head in the sand? That's just a old wives' tale? 
It is in many places people believe it is a wi- a wives' tale. They yeah. they think it's a wives' tale because you see they dig deep. If they see something interesting, they'll put their head right down. And if there's mm. grass, you can't see their head. So it looks like the head is in the sand okay. or the head is in the ground. Um who knows? Uh, I like the old wives' tale. I like the fact that oh. they stick their head in the ground. Uh, <laughs> like to me, <laughs> I, I'll stick to the old-fashioned way and say, I, I like that. Okay, me too. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, right. Now, let's have a look at my favorite, the little meerkat. Meerkats are beautiful creatures. One of the funniest things that meerkats do, they don't sleep on their own. They sleep on in a stack. They sleep on top of each other. They pile up on top of each other. The poor ones on the bottom, <laughs> they don't weigh very much, but they, that is how they sleep. They sleep in a stack, whether it's outside the 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 home or inside they make an underground home um uh, they they have their underground home where with lots of little ins and outs and they live in there now the most important job in the whole meerkat community is to be the sentry to be the person who is the lookout and they stand on top and they watch and they look in the sky for any prey coming from the sky. They look for anything that might be slithering in from out on the ground level or slightly above the ground level. They then give a call. And if everybody is outside playing because they love to play, they have such fun climbing and playing and doing, they will make a call. And within a second, there isn't a meerkat in sight. They are down into their burrows because they have lots of entries into the burrows. Then when they think the the, uh, danger has passed, the enemy is gone, that sentry is the only person to go out. He goes out to check. And if if the thing hasn't gone and he gets taken, then they have to have another sentry. sentry. Um, And so uh, he is the most important person in the the group. Uh, They call themselves a mob. And I think it's wonderful because they do look like a mob. There's just so many of them. And they're all ages, they're all sizes, and everybody plays together. And they've got this very interesting little look on their face as much as to say, what are you doing over there? Hmm. And so they really are the cutest little animals. Uh, They have 10 different sounds that they make. They can murmur. They can growl like a dog. They can spit. They can cluck as if they say, what are you doing now? Uh, And then they have the defense of bark, which is the alarm. So they really do, and they chat to each other while they are playing. So they really have an interesting life and they are such beautiful little creatures, the meerkat. You always see them standing, whoopsie, I've jumped a page because I moved my screen. They always see them uh, standing up. They all look, they all look as if they're wanting to know what's happening here. What can I go and do next? What mischief can I get into? Particularly the younger ones. And so it is a a lovely group of animals that live together. Anybody got uh, any questions on the meerkat? Right. They sleep in a heap. That to me is the funniest. I've seen them outside sleeping in heaps as well. So you get a lot of heaps of people. Right. Now, I finished with the smaller animals, but I want to finish with an animal I couldn't leave out, and that is the antelope family. But there are a lot of them. And so I couldn't make a page for each one. We would have been here till tomorrow. So I'm just going to talk in general about the different ones. The one in the very center of your page is the springbok. That is our national animal. For South Africa, the springbok is a, a very beautiful animal, and you can tell the difference between him and an impala because they're about the same size because of the color of the dark stripe on the th- side of the animal and the white rump underneath. 
and they can jump. When they spring, they spring along, they jump along. It is beautiful to see them. The impala are the ones that you see the most. Um, there are always impala around and they are in very large herds. And they feed on the lower leaves of the plants as they are going along. The one next to them is an inyala. Uh, he is a very sort of, uh, got a, a thick fur on him. He's a furry type animal and he's tall. He's probably just under two, two meters, about six foot high. Um, and he's, he's got a thick fur on him and he's got very interesting eyes. They're kind of white and they kind of join together. So he looks as if he's wearing binoculars when he, he looks at you. Um, beautiful horns. Most of the antelope, in fact, all of them, except for the little baby bushbuck, have the most beautiful horns. And unfortunately, hunters hunt them for the horns because they like to put them up as trophies on their walls. But they are not endangered. They, they do breed quite easily. And so um, we still are able to have that many animals. Going across the top, the one at the end with the beautiful straight horns that he has is the Chemsbok. The Chemsbok lives in the Kalahari Desert. He's a desert animal um, and he lives on what little plants grow in the desert areas. He doesn't need a lot of food, but he is so beautiful. His markings are very distinct. The white on the ears, the white on the legs. You can pick up a chemspok very easily when you're looking at them. And also his straight horns. He's the only one who has absolutely dead straight horns going up off his head. We've got the bontebok is the next one. He's got a, like a white bum. So it's very easy. He's got a white, that's a bless book. That's a bless book. Sorry, bless book. He's got this white front to his nose and he's got the white bum. Some people call it a bonta book or a bless book. The white on his front is bless. They say he's got a blessing down the front. Very interesting um, horns as well. We've got the springbok in the middle, middle and then the sable. The sable is a very elegant animal. Uh, he's got straight up horns, but they curve at the end and they've got um, like ripples in them. They're, they're a ripply horn. It's not a smooth horn at all. It's a ripple horn. Very, very beautiful. Black, white underneath his tummy. Then you've got the waterbuck. Now, the water bug to me, uh, we always used to joke, well, he sat on a toilet seat and it had just been painted because you have this perfect round circle on their rump. It's either a target or it's a toilet seat. <laughs> we called it the toilet seat. Oh, there's the toilet seat. And they have this distinct uh, white circle on their bottoms so they really do look funny with that very beautiful gentle animals all of them are very gentle now when i spoke about animals that take down other animals and i spoke about an earlunt this is an earlunt he is big he looks almost like a bull or um, a bear. he's a big solid animal he's got a big sort of cowl in front here very strong horns and you don't normally see more than two, two or three earlunt together. Very often you see them on their own as well. It's one of the, the solitary ones, the bigger ones. And then you get the kudu. The kudu are lovely animals. They have, it looks like water or paint has been put on the middle of their back and it's dripped down on the sides of them. But I had a wonderful encounter with a, a a kudu. We were in a camp where the animals could roam in and out, including the lion. Uh, any animal could come in and out of it. We were right next to the Kruger Park with an opening in the fence. So anything could come and go. Uh, people had their homes in there. They built them on stilts purely because it was easier to keep the animals out of the house was if it was on a stilt. And um, they used to complain bitterly that the little baby lions ate holes in their um, hose pipes 
so they had to hide the hose pipes from the babies. But um, the, the one night we were sitting eating and there were three or four of us, we were sitting, we'd made our, our dinner and the other's eyes got bigger and bigger. And I, thought, I said, what's wrong? They said, don't look around, but you have got a kudu standing right behind you. Unfortunately, we didn't have cell phones at that stage to take pictures. And the next thing over my shoulder came this nose and it wanted the mealy, or you call it corn, that was on my plate. And it helped itself to the corn and off it went. Oh. It was the strangest encounter to have this kudu put its head over the top and help itself to what it wanted. And then away it went quite happily and everybody just sat very still and observed what was happening. Um, and it, it was a wonderful encounter with a kudu. And then the last animal I'll talk about is the little bushbuck. You see them in the deep bush. They don't come into the flat plains to eat grass or to eat the edge leaves on those bushes that are outside. They stay inside the bush. It's their form of protection. But you do see them quite often. They, they're in and out. And if you stay in a camp that allows animals in and out, you are very likely to see a little baby bushbuck coming in and helping itself to what it would like. So these animals, as I said before, are all very beautiful, but you treat them as wild and also understand you are in their area. You are in their territory, so treat it with respect. If you do that, you can have amazing encounters with wonderful animals. Well, I hope that you all enjoyed our, our tour, our journey. Um, if you would like a copy of the recording, please uh, request it at help at getsetup.io. Um, there are three others in the animal series. There is uh, Wild Animals of Australia, part one and two, and the other one of the wild animals of Africa being the ones that most people know, the big five, plus a few others. Right, I'm going to stop sharing now. If anybody, oh, that's interesting. I don't want to share. No, thank you. Um, I yeah, want to stop sharing. Yeah. Right, if anybody's got anything they would like to say or would like to ask, please feel free now. Um, yes, Gail. Um, the, the animal that came over your shoulder and mm -hmm. grabbed your corn must have felt very comfortable with you. Yeah, she obviously did. Yeah, yeah. she felt very comfortable. It was a female and she, she obviously felt we'd been there for a few days. She'd obviously been observing us. She'd obviously seen that um, we were, weren't a threat to her. And so she was very happy to, to come and help herself. <laughs> that, that same trip that we were there, I op we, we were in a tent. I opened the tent, and um, when I opened the tent, there was a no. pole next to the tent. And I thought, we didn't put our tent next to a pole. And I looked up the pole, and it was a giraffe. It was the leg of the giraffe. Oh, my I was favorite. looking at this leg, and wow. I could have touched it, but I didn't. I kept, I stayed away. I didn't touch it. I just let it walk away. I, it, for me, it was just such an experience to watch it and to see it. Uh, so it, it really I'm so was. jealous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, Thank Shirley, you. yes, you've got something you'd like to say. Yeah, do you see these daily or do you have no, to travel? To no, the... you don't see them in the city at all. Um, uh, yeah, yes and no. No, you, most of the animals are all kept in the very large parks or the smaller parks oh. for oh. their own safety and for ours. You couldn't have a lion walking down the middle of the street. You'd have everybody scattering. So, no, they all live in the huge parks. You take your holiday time or weekend, a long weekend, and you head off to the park. Oh. And then you drive through the park looking at different things. But sometimes, like where I stay, is just to the side of the park. And then these animals wander in and out while you are busy, while you are there. 
I've seen some some very funny things happen while we've been there. I think for me the funniest, and I tell it in my other class, is we were we were waiting to go. We were coming into the park, and when you come in, you cross a river, and the one river we were crossing was called the Crocodile River, and we were just waiting to cross, but we could see something was on the bridge, and we saw somebody on a bicycle that was leaving the park and was coming to go out, and he came down, and he obviously realized what was in the middle of the the. Um, Uh, bridge we had now got our binoculars out and we could see it was two lions they were lying sunning themselves on the bridge (laughs) and he started from this hill and he came down he couldn't stop himself so all he did was lift his legs as high as they would go held onto the handlebars and went right next to the lions (laughs) I think the lions were just as so surprised they didn't move and he shot past and out but His face was a picture. He was absolutely terrified. He knew he couldn't stop, so he just went. And it was so funny to see. Um, So we do, I have seen some wonderful things, and I'm hoping that people are going to bring their own stories to encounters with wild animals. I certainly have a few that I will be sharing as well with them. So if you've got encounters, things that you've seen when you've traveled in all different countries, doesn't matter which country, even in your own country, if you've had an encounter with something as small as a snake or as big as a bear, it doesn't matter. It's an, and it can be a funny encounter. It can be a scary encounter. It can be an amazing encounter. So let's hope that people will bring some really super things to the class. Anybody got anything else they'd like to say? Right. Thank you. Well, I enjoyed it. I'm glad. So nice to see you again, Natalie. Lovely to have you in class again. And Laurie as well. There are a lot of faces. I see Melinda as well, Donna. Great to have you all back in class. Uh, I look at in for May, my classes will be a bit earlier. They're moving classes around. So it'll make it within a time frame that's maybe a little bit more sociable for you in summertime. All right. Have a great evening, everyone. I look forward to seeing you all again sometime. Thank you, James, for all the things you put in the side. It Mm -hmm. was great to be able to do that. Have a great evening. Bye for now. Thank you very much, Sue. Thank you very much.